medieval combat. From one-on-one -on -one duels, 10v10 melees, all the way up to 150 versus 150 all-out wars. These lot aren't playing games. And I took a two-handed axe to the head and drove into my brain about a centimeter. <laughs> this is a legit sport and it's just completely mental. And this seemingly hyper-niche sport has grown into these international championships that are hosted in these incredible historic castles. And in today's video, we will explore how the hell this all happened. Now, I've got to come clean. This video actually came about as, as kind of an accident. Originally, I was planning to make a video on LARPing. It was going to be funny, a little bit playful, and then... Well, I stumbled across this one video titled The Hardest KO at M1 Medieval. And I kind of just sat there like bewildered, listening to these two commentators who didn't have a clue what they were commentating on. It follows up with a right, a right slash, should we call it. But this baby had 14 million views and I was there captivated watching these two beefy boys in a full suit of armor smack the crap out of each other. This led me on like a five hour YouTube rabbit hole and introduced me to this crazy world of Boho. Now, Boha is the OG historic name. All around the world, there are different names for different leagues, but before we get into that, let's start with how Boha came around. Now, Boha actually dates back to the 12th century, so between 1100 and 1200 AD, and it actually comes from the old French word Boherd, which literally translates to wallop. <laughs> you see, during the medieval period, tournament fighting was super popular. Basically, when these knights weren't risking their lives in wars, they would instead risk their lives in tournament fights, just for fun. These tournament fights served as a place to like practice strategy. Up your fight in techers and test out weapons. Just picture like the jewel arena in RuneScape. But you see, there was a problem because people kept dying. Which if you're trying to have a really powerful army, it's a little bit counterintuitive to kill them in, in play fights. So many years and many dead nights later, someone would have the genius idea of saying, guys, how about we just blunt in the weapons so people don't die as much. From here, Bohurt would become a massive sport where the best knights would travel from tournament to tournament fighting. And if you were pretty nice with the blade, you could make a small fortune. And very likely a lord would see how good you were and kind of sign you up as his protection, which would give you a secure future. So basically it was just a more bloody version of university. Knights in this era were like super soldiers. You would have these famous knights who would be feared all around the world. You would have a man like Godfrey of Bullignon, the Scottish William Wallace, and a good old English boy called William Marshall. But you see, this era of Bohurt would eventually come to an end. It would last between the 1200s to the 1340s, but then it officially came to its end in 1342. Basically because all of the kings and the lords that kind of governed the sport, they were always bickering at each other about the rules or like the terms for the tournament. And eventually at this event in 1342, they came to the conclusion that enough was enough because they didn't really know why they were doing this. Like knights were still dying and they were spending a lot of money and resource on these fights, all of which were probably better used for the actual wars that were happening at the time. So the sport of Bohurt died. <laughs> Bohurt would lie dormant for centuries. That was until the 90s, when a couple of Ruskies came along. Before we go any further, today's video is brought to you by Soul App. Soul is a fast-growing new social media app designed to connect you with like-minded people with similar interests. The Soul App's algorithm is designed to create like a kind of social playground around the things that you love, be that sports, gaming, music, whatever. For instance, say you like skateboarding or parkour. You can connect with people about that and play a role in building the community around your interests. By clicking the Explore tab, you can type the name of the thing that you're interested in and explore all of the content for that. And on top of just looking at content, you can also share your own. Some of the interesting functions are things like Planet, where the algorithm will find people with like similar interests to you, connect you with them and show you their content. This is a great way of discovering new ideas that can inspire you with your hobby. There is also the Soul Quiz, that is like a brief MTBI personality test. You do that and then the algorithm can find like an obscure interest that you might never have heard of that actually suits you perfectly and it will recommend it to you. Be sure to go to the links below to download the Soul app for free now. Anyway, back to the video. They would put on these big festivals and like celebrate medieval history. And in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, all these kind of countries they were very popular and at the same time in the rest of the world reenactment groups were popping up more and more more commonly known as larping groups which is a term that is definitely 
slightly scoffed at. But regardless, over in America, one of the main organizers for LARPing was the SCA. They have this one event called the Pensick War that literally sees like 10,000 plus people. Pensick and the war itself actually has its own law built into it. They've basically reimagined America as if it was like a medieval country. Split up into factions, they go to war, and if you win, you win the Pensick War. And you know, to me, as a big nerd, that sounds really cool. But to most people, it doesn't. It sounds like nerds running around and slapping each other with polystyrene sticks. Killing blow two, killing blow three. Wow. You see, over time, the LARPing community developed a hunger for legit medieval combat. And from this was birthed historic medieval combat otherwise known as HMB. Over in Europe, the HMBIA is like the main official organizer. And it is the original, like the founding league. And in 2005, they would host their first event, being the European Championship in Ukraine. And at this time, there was just two events. There was sword versus sword and sword and shield. These fighters or, or knights would literally fight each other with real weapons in a real suit of armor and would score points based on a marking criteria. But this was early days in the sport, so the rules were still kind of being made up. And it would take until 2009 for the very first Battle of the Nations. Battle of the Nations, or BOTN, is an international historic medieval combat world championship. This is the World Cup of medieval combat. And for this first event, they went all out. They hired out this place called the Koitin Fortress in Ukraine. Looking at this place, it's, it's insane. It looks amazing. I can just picture a load of noobs running around in an iron helmet spamming buying GF. Anyway, at this first event, four countries took part, being the Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Russia. And this very first event saw around 100 fighters who would take part in just three different events. The 1v1 duel, 5v5 group battles, and an all-out 25 versus 25 clan war. And after the intense battle was over and the last sword fell, one nation would emerge victorious. Mother Russia. Now, as I was saying, this, this event wasn't a reenactment. They weren't using foam weapons. This was a full combat sport. Real weapons, real armor, a full rule set that all the nations were competing under. And they were just beating the crap out of each other. Like, people would get hurt. Being stretched off the battlefield, it wasn't uncommon. But as word spread of this event, more and more nations wanted to compete to claim the title. And so nations would put forward a team. A team had to consist of at least eight people up to a maximum of 50. And to get on one of these teams, you'd need to do well in your national competitions. And as I was mentioning, a lot of these competitions are held at like historic sites. And there's a really heavy emphasis towards historical accuracy. So like effectively, you can use whatever armor and weapon you want, providing you can whip out some historic paperwork to prove that it was around in the era. But over time, they would start to get quite lenient as to what countries can compete, because obviously many Evil Europe is Europe. But alas, they let some Canadians in from Quebec in 2011. And America came in at 2012. It is quite funny seeing like American and Canadian flags on medieval armor. By 2013, BOTN had grown from the original four teams that competed with over 22 different teams with about 400 fighters total. But you see, something behind the scenes was happening and a fair few people were, were getting pretty unhappy. The Russians were completely dominating the sport, and they still are. But allegedly, a very wealthy Russian oligarch is like the financial backer for the sport. And there have been allegations of corruption and cheating. Like for instance, the Americans were told that they're not allowed to wear their footwear that they had bought in from America, pretty much the moment they left America, which yeah, is kind of a dick move. But you see, there was never any like hard evidence to prove that Russia were cheating. That was until one day when one of the Russian organizers were caught on camera, basically holding up a fighter as he was going to fall to the ground, so kind of keeping him in the game. And when this footage got out there, well, everyone kind of kicked off. The Americans went off and created what is called the IMCF. But we'll get more into what they do in a moment. Despite all the allegations of corruptions, the Russians are definitely on top of this sport. And they've completely cleaned up their act since 2013. And their fighters have become like legends of the sport. You've got Sergei Yukolov, who is an absolute beast. From BOTN 2011 to 2014, Sergei was the reigning champion of 1v1 duels. His reign would come to an end in 2015 in Prague, where a man by the name of Yevgeny Lapig beat Sergei and become the champion. And this title of like world champion has passed between very few hands over the years. The other person is Alexei Petrik, who took the title in 2016 and has held it ever since. But you see, th this was all well and good, but in 2015, everything would change, with the introduction of what is known as Pro Fights. Pro Fights is also often referred to as medieval MMA, basically allowing for like punching, kicking, takedowns, and 
all kinds of things. I gotta be honest, to me, this is the most exciting one to watch because it's just like unrestrained combat. You can just do what you want. The best fighter wins. I'm not sure exactly how the pro fight thing came about, but one of the very early events was hosted by M1, which is like the Russian UFC. It's a massive MMA company. They partnered up with HMBIA to host what was intended to be just like a gimmick event, like a halftime show between the fights just to give the audience something to watch. But it ended up being super popular and getting millions and millions of views online. In 2018, BOTM would pick up pro fights and start introducing them to their event with the fights kind of split into like weight categories. I just can't get over these events. There's just something about it. It's both hilarious and incredibly impressive at the same time. Each fighter's corner has a blacksmith and a potions trader. <laughs> I want to see a fair fight, no spells, no summons. When your father raised you to be a crusader, but you wanted to be an MMA fighter. I think it was these M1 fights that really popped off medieval combat online. For me, it's like the juxtaposition of seeing these warriors in full metal armor from the medieval period being thrown into like a modern professional looking MMA ring with, with commentators who are clueless. What do you think we're going to see in this fight? I have no idea, Jaren. The old image of like nerdy LARPers smacking each other with plastic sticks and casting runescape spells was was gone. There is just no way that you could honestly watch one of these fights and then call it late. On top of that, just imagine what these fighters are going through. Like broad summer's day, you're boiling hot, you're wearing three to four stone worth of armor. Underneath that, you've got like a thick protective layer that would leave you sweating like a pig, all whilst having like one inch of visibility. Like if you can imagine, that is all you can see. As well, your helmet is restricting the oxygen to your head, so you're like suffocating, all the while getting twatted around the head with like metal axes and swords. And like, if it isn't obvious, getting hit by these weapons hurts a lot. No less the pain, but just imagine the sound, like getting smacked with metal against your metal helmet. It's gonna sound like a firework has just gone off inside your helmet. And people do get hurt, like you break bones, get concussions, you get bloodied up, like it's it's legit. But like obviously there are a lot of rules and regulations to keep it safe, at least relatively safe compared to other combat sports. Like you can't go into one of these fights after just coming back from the blacksmith who sharpened up your new fresh shiv. Weapons do have to be blunted and they check rigorously on the length, the weight, the sharpness, etc. As well, the armor itself is made out of tempered steel, meaning that if you get whacked really hard, the armor doesn't crush in and like keep you stuck in the armor. It's designed so that you can pop out any of those dents and not get stuck. And on top of all of that, the refs do a really good job at like keeping it safe and they'll stop you from hitting weak points like the gaps in your armor behind your knee and around your neck. I'm gonna guess that you're wondering like who would be attracted to doing this. And honestly, most of the fighters will have no shame in admitting that they are just nerds. Not all of them, but there's a lot of geeks, like people who just love medieval history, video games, stuff like that. It does attract a lot of people like that. But on top of that, you get a lot of army veterans, just historic buffs. Men do it, women do it. You get all kinds of people, but obviously it does attract a certain sort that's willing to get hit with steel weapons. I was actually fortunate enough to speak with a legend of medieval combat called Simon Rorich. He's a proper OG, he's won titles, he's the real deal. He explained to me that he got into it through these reenactment groups and just got bored of hitting people with plastic sticks and decided he wanted to do the real thing. And he's gone on to become a legend of the sport. When I found out this sport came about, Bohort is when I fell in love with it. He's competed in nearly all of the BOTN competitions, other than one where his helmet once fell off. And I took a two-handed axe to the head of a 14-inch scar in the back, took a quarter sized piece of bone and drove it into my brain about a centimeter. <laughs> and, and had to miss one of the events. But he's all right now and he still competes. But Simon actually makes a living off of Boha. He's a national champion. He gets flown around the world to go to all of these different events. The companies sponsor him with armor and weapons. And regional teams will invite him out to do seminars, or as they call them, Simonars. But as far as professionality is concerned, there are very few professionals. Yukolov, who I mentioned earlier, makes a living. Martin Voskilis, or something like that. These guys are a tiny minority. And despite what it looks, it isn't actually just a sport that's for the boys. Like, you do get girls that take part in this as well. There's one lady called Lara Sevoli, who's just an absolute sav. <laughs> But yeah, professionals, it's, it's rare. There, there is more money out in Russia due to the fact that they have these big financial backers, but in America and the rest of Europe, 
yeah, it's, it's not common that people make money doing this. The Russians are hands down the best. They win nearly all of the big national events. And at BOTN, they hold an insane 61 gold medals. But you know, the UK, we, we have a good few fighters as well. And in recent years, we've been doing better and better. There's a guy called Lucas Cowell and Daniel Winter, who, you know, they're out here repping the UK. Lucas Cowell. Lucas Cowell. And if you're thinking about all the people that go to these events and the people that aren't there that go to like regional events, every single one of them has to buy armor, weapons, etc. It's a lot of money. So one of the things that does hold this sport back is just how expensive it is. You know, normally you can get LARP armor for 500 bucks or something head to toe in some mild steel, you know, that kind of thing. Our stuff has to be tempered and hardened so it increases the labor. And so a minimum cost for armor is about three grand. If we just have a little look through some of the weapon and armor dealers, which you don't have to go to World 2 outside of Varrock Bank, you can, you can just go on a website. You've got medievalweaponry.co.uk, Medieval Extreme. And like, if you just scroll through some of these items, you get an idea of how expensive it is. You end up trading it to some shady guy who says he's going to trim your room plate. You're probably looking at more like $10,000 for accessories and stuff to make yourself look cool. And then you've got to take all of your armor and ship it to the event. So if you're an American and you want to fight in Europe, it's going to be pretty difficult to explain to customs why you've got a suit of armor and swords in your, in your luggage. So you'll have to pay to ship it out separately, which, you know, it adds up. So because of all that, the sport is very isolated to people who can afford it. The price point is a massive barrier to entry. So speaking to Simon, it's hard to know how big this sport could be. It's probably not going to be the next fad. Like you're not going to get kids coming into school in a full suit of arms. But maybe one day it will make just enough money to support a few very top level athletes into being professionals. The US may one day have like an M1 medieval kind of league. Big renaissance fairs might hire these people. It's violent in a way that they've never seen. So we have a unique uh, way to entertain people. New combat games like Capture the Flag and stuff like that that they're testing at the moment, they might attract more viewers. There's no betting regulation on combat sports using weapons. There's nothing here in the United States. Like the first person to ever like with some money to back it to like get into Vegas is gonna make a bunch of money. But you know, all in all, as like a Lord of the Rings fan and RuneScape junkie, I love seeing this. This this is awesome. This is the kind of things that humans do best, which is just finding obscure hobbies and sports, putting on big events, people go to watch it. It's great. I love to see it. And personally, I really want to go to like a big UK festival for this thing. I would love to go to some medieval thing and see people doing this. But every single website is just terribly made. I nearly threw my laptop out the window just trying to book a ticket, so to please sort that out. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this sport in the comments below. Anyway, if you enjoyed that video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I've got new merch out now on jimmythegiant.co.uk. You can massively support me by picking something up there, donating to me on Patreon, or using the sponsor link below. Peace. Woo!